My name is Jake Wharton. I work at a company called Square, and I'm here to give you an introduction to the Kotlin language, uh, sort of in the context of Gradle, why you would want to use the language um, in different aspects of Gradle. Uh, so we'll mostly be focusing on understanding the syntax of Kotlin uh, to start with and kind of the constructs that it provides, why we would want to use it. And then towards the end, I will um, apply that to actually the different aspects of Gradle and, and where you would actually use it. Uh, so it, it, it bears talking about, about why this language exists, uh, just so for some background. Uh, Kotlin is a, a programming language created by a company called JetBrains. Um, if you are not familiar with JetBrains, that would be surprising. They make uh, tons of really amazing IDEs. Uh, the most interesting one is this one in the lower left-hand corner. This is IntelliJ IDEA. Uh, it's sort of the foundation on which all the other IDEs are built, and it, um, it turned into the IntelliJ platform, uh, which you can build IDEs on top of, which their IDEs are built on top of. And if you're an Android developer, you may be familiar or at least have heard of Android Studio. Android Studio is also built on this IntelliJ platform. Uh, the community edition of IntelliJ is completely open source uh, as of, I don't even know, a couple, um, probably six or eight years now. Uh, so we can look inside and we can see there's approximately three and a half million lines of Java inside just the IntelliJ community edition. So there's an ultimate edition that's on top of that, which adds plugins, and then you have all these other IDEs which have their own language-specific editions uh, uh, built on top of that. So this is a company that intimately knows Java and is fundamentally tied to this platform. And so if, uh, if you've done Java development, um, there's sort of this understanding of languages that uh, this curve of understanding or, or maybe even appreciation that you go through in almost every language where you start off being really productive and, and sort of liking what you're seeing and then you, you run into things like, oh, well, generics are kind of weird and um, we can't, you know, we have maybe single inheritance you don't like coming from another language or uh, you don't like that you can't extend, you can't add methods to classes, all, all, the, all the things, the classic things of Java that we hated or even a few years ago that we didn't have um, an analogous of closures in the language and that the, the language itself is filled with a bunch of boilerplate. Eventually you kind of bottom out and start looking at other languages. So maybe you go to, uh, and this is not other JVM languages, you might reach out to like um, C or C++ or you look at newcomers, Rust and D, or you go maybe for the web, PHP or ASP.NET or C Sharp, all these other languages. Um, but a lot of people wind up sticking in the Java ecosystem, and eventually you kind of start to appreciate the things that Java gives you. The JVM, how you have you know, this jitted language that gets faster the more you use it. Uh, garbage collection handled automatically. Uh, you start to appreciate the like, ecosystem of Java, all the libraries that are available. Uh, and so Kotlin is not born from when you're kind of at the bottom of this uh, valley or really, really hating on Java a lot. This is when you would jump ship to other languages. Uh, Kotlin comes from this like going back up the curve where you really start to appreciate the things about the platform that we're in. Uh, you're just not happy with the language itself. And so you might look to a Groovy or a Scala in the past uh, as JetBrains did when they were looking for something to sort of improve their millions and millions of lines of Java code. And instead they chose to invent their own language uh, with the goal of kind of shallowing out this, this bottom. So as you, uh, as you start using the language and you find things you don't like and you don't like uh, get, get down in the weeds so much to where you look to other languages and then there's a faster kind of uptick to where you really appreciate the things that they've built. Uh, and so that's, that's what Kotlin is. It's about five or six years old now. Uh, just reached 1.0 something like a year ago. Uh, and you're starting to see it um, inside IntelliJ itself. Obviously, there's big adoption from the Android community. And you see uh, a bunch of libraries, both on Android and server, uh, starting to take Kotlin as a first class citizen. Uh, and once you start using the language, you really grow to appreciate it. And that's, that's because it's built by this company that has these millions of lines of Java. And so they, they intimately know the pains and the things that cause them problems. And so the whole language is designed very pragmatically to try and fix those things. All right. Um, so before we actually start talking about syntax, uh, I just want to preface 
why you're here at a Gradle Summit, um, learning about Kotlin, why, why it's an interesting language. Uh, I'm going to postulate that you fall into one of three categories. Uh, you're potentially a, a plugin author. Plugins traditionally have been built with uh, Groovy for its terseness, or maybe uh, you know, partially with Java for the performance side. Um, maybe you're looking for some ways to get both of those without any of the compromises of either. You work with build scripts a lot, and you know that the, the dynamism of Groovy is taken to its extreme in Gradle build scripts. Um, there's you know, very little IDE help. Type safety is all but completely missing. Um, we've fallen into this culture of really just copy-pasting things from Stack Overflow or the documentation to try and get it to work. Uh, so maybe you're looking to you know, correct that. Or potentially you're just an app developer. Um, you are a, someone that uses Gradle to build your project, and you're building, uh, targeting the JVM. All right, so let's look into the, uh, let's start learning the syntax of Kotlin. And again, this is going to be the bulk of the presentation. If you have any questions about what you're seeing, feel free to um, stop me so I can clarify on, uh, on the spot and in, in context with what we're looking at. Uh, to start with, we're going to look at um, local properties. So in Java, you know, inside a method, you would declare a local variable. Um, Kotlin, we don't really talk about variables. Uh, we talk about properties. And so here what we see is first that there is a keyword in front of our property, our local property, uh, val. This denotes it as read only. Uh, we're going to see what that means in a second. The next thing you might notice is that the order of the type and the name are reversed. Uh, why this was done also will become apparent in a second. Uh, and then I think the most important thing to note here is uh, that the concept of null has been elevated into the type system of Kotlin. So you, you hear this quote thrown around all the time about how null is the billion dollar mistake. Um, that's quite incorrect, actually, because it's the absence of being able to express nullability in the type system is the actual mistake. Um, a representation of absence, which is what null is, is actually something that's, that's very much needed. And the fact that null allows you to do it without an abstraction like optional means it's very low overhead. So by elevating into the type system, we can now know statically whether or not a type can uh, be null or not. And then the compiler can now enforce that before you dereference a type that may be null, you have to null check it, or you have to provide you know, some other uh, branch or some other way of supplying a default value. And then similarly, if a type is non-nullable and you null check it, you get a warning saying that well, you don't have to be doing this. Uh, so the reason that we have the type and the name reversed is that because of a lot of times you can infer the type based on the context on the right side of the equal sign. So usually we're calling a method, uh, referencing a field, or referencing a constant here, and the type is unambiguous. It can only be one thing. And so why do we have to redeclare it when it can be inferred from the right-hand side? Kotlin allows us to just omit the type declaration whenever it's redundant. And if you think, well, I won't know what these types are. Um, usually that's an indicator of bad method naming, bad field naming. Uh, if you call a method called get user and it returns something other than a user object, then maybe the method name needs changed, not, um, not the fact that the type is not being specified being the problem. Um, Kotlin, as a language, has very strong interop with other JVM languages, Java being the primary one. Um, this seems obvious, but as a company that invested with millions of lines of Java, like JetBrains, they can't afford to be rewriting everything without a really strong interop story. So if we have a traditional you know, bean from Java, um, Kotlin actually is going to expose this as a property. And so I talked about local properties before, which are sort of the Java equivalent of local variables. Um, there's really not fields in Kotlin. We just have um, properties that are on the class instead. And so here, our user object, from the perspective of Kotlin, gets these two methods collapsed into a single representation. So when we're dereferencing it as, as wanting to pull the value out, it will call the getter. Uh, and if we you know, put an equal sign next to it and try and write a value in, it will call the setter. There's also uh, string interpolation, which is handy, so you don't have to do manual concatenation. You can put any expression you want between those curly braces. And if you're just referencing a, a variable directly, you don't even need the curly braces. You can just reference it with the dollar sign. 
conversely, uh, if we were to declare this class in Kotlin and look at it from the Java side, uh, the property turns into two methods. So we have the, the getter that we're able to call, and then we have the setter. Uh, so this shows you that from both directions, you really get uh, strong interop, but more importantly, you get uh, a, a very idiomatic feel. So from the Java side, you get the getters and setters that you're used to. From the Kotlin side, you get those unified in a property that you can then read and write to, and it just calls through to the right thing. I talked about the val keyword. Oh, sorry. So if you're using a if you're using a um, something like Hungarian notation to prefix your properties, um, it it will just translate that directly to the method. So you'll have get m name. Um, but I mean, if, you've done it in Java. if you've done it in Java, well, you would the the properties uh, call through to the methods, not the field. So if you had like m name as a private field and then a getter and setter, the property would be representative of the getter and setter name, not the field. I talked about the val keyword. Um, this only allows you to write the reference once. So here I can't you know, change the reference from a single user to another user. If I were to declare this as var, it would allow me to do that. Uh, and those correspond to value and variable. Uh, the IDE will also visually differentiate these so that you're able to uh, kind of see where the mutation is in you know, a method uh, to hopefully make more clear where um, where any mutation is happening, since those most frequently are the source of bugs. We have a way to extend, sorry, yes? Oh, yes. Yeah, um, if you declare something as a var, but then you never um, write it after the initial declaration, is there any way that you get feedback and see where things change and make a valid exception? Yes, if, if you create a var and you never write to it more than once, the IDE will warn you and say, and you can hot fix it right to a val. Uh, we're, we're allowed to extend types in a certain way, uh, so we can add methods to types that we don't control, that we can't otherwise change. So here I'm adding um, a really useful isTuesday method to the date class, uh, and then if I have an instance of date, I'm allowed to call that function, sorry, I guess I should say, um, Kotlin, we refer to them as functions, not methods. I'm allowed to call that function on a date as if it were an instance method, even though that method's not declared uh, you know, on the date class. You will notice that it's, it's italicized, and if you're familiar with uh, IntelliJ, um, italicized means static. Um, that's because these actually compile to just a static method that takes the instance as the first argument. Uh, and what's great is that that also means you can use these from the Java side as well, uh, just as if you were writing you know, a normal static helper method where the first instance is the class you want to operate on. Uh, and so by default here, if this was defined in a uh, file called date, uh, we would get a date kt class. You can actually control this, so from the Java side, you can make it um, something like dates or date util. There's an annotation that allows you to control uh, the naming from the Java side. Um, the language has lambdas. Uh, there's not a whole lot I'm gonna say about that here. Uh, in this case, we're calling the execute method on a uh, executor, which takes a runnable. Um, so it's doing the same conversion that you would see in Java, where the single method interface turned into a lambda. Yes? In uh, Java, there's the whole act as final in order to reference the variables. Would this have element of the same limitation? Um, yes. So in Java, the, a variable has to be effectively final for it to be able to be referenced inside the, a lambda. Um, I believe that is the same. I'm actually not super sure on that. If you want to come up, we can try it after. Or if we have time, I'll just try it live. Um, if we hoist the body of the lambda into you know, a normal method, we can also use a method reference exactly the same way you would as in Java. All right, getting a little more advanced here. Um, if you define an interface with a single method in Kotlin, it's not going to let you uh, write a lambda to replace that when calling a function. There's actually a dedicated syntax for declaring a type that's a, um, able to be, it's a function type, but it's able to be called with uh, lambda. And so it, it looks kind of like a little method. You have the argument 
uh, types and then an arrow to the return type. And so this is a, um, a lambda type where we're taking the T and returning a Boolean. And so we can call this method uh, on you know, a list of integers where we're, say, filtering out the odds. Uh, here I've named the argument. Uh, if there's only a single argument to a lambda, we actually can omit the arguments and just refer to it as, refer to this single argument as it. Uh, but if there are multiple arguments, you have to you know, actually give them names. If the last argument to a function is a lambda, you can move that lambda outside the parentheses. So watch the little parenthesis on the right. Uh, we can actually just call it, call them uh, function as if there's no arguments and then append the lambda to the end. And since there's actually no arguments, we don't even need the parentheses. Uh, so you get this nice declarative kind of filter with the, uh, the body of the lambda that you want to pass in. And if there were arguments, uh, you know, like this hypothetical other method, it's actually not hypothetical, it's in the standard library. You would pass the arguments that are required and then the, the last argument, which is the lambda, can be outside the, uh, outside the parentheses. It's not actually outside the function call, it's just visually represented outside the parentheses. We'll see why this is useful in a bit. Okay. Um, I don't know how I want to frame this. Um, so there's a there's a interesting property, I guess, of the compiler, which is that you can take a function and declare it as inline. And so what this means is that if we have an implementation of this function, and when we call it down below, uh, what the compiler is actually going to do is is take that implementation and um, sort of copy paste it into the call site. I mean, it's not copy paste. It actually happens at the bytecode level. But if we were to pretend that it happens at the source code level, uh, it would take this and kind of inline it into the call site. Uh, there's a lot of advantages of this. Um, usually the one uh, that I give is in the context of Android where we no longer have to allocate an object to represent the lambda, and we no longer have to actually dispatch a function call. And so if the body of the method is, is small enough and maybe uh, sensitive to allocation or sensitive to performance, we can actually get it inline down into the call sites. Uh, I'm gonna show another uh, example where this actually is, is really powerful because inlining doesn't make a whole lot of sense for just normal functions, uh, especially if you're just programming for the JVM because that's something that uh, you kinda wanna rely on the JIT to do for you. Uh, but here we have a method that takes a, a class reference and then filters out instances of that class. So we're taking in the class and then you know, calling some method to filter out instances of that type in a list. What would be nice is that if we didn't have to pass in that class because we, we're sort of defining this as a generic method and, and at the call site the compiler will be able to tell what type we're actually wanting to get back. But this doesn't work, right? This doesn't work in Java either because of erasure. The T's turn into objects and we, you know, this doesn't actually do anything. You might think that inlining helps here because then it's gonna you know, copy paste this implementation and then it won't be a T, it'll actually be something else. Uh, but that's not quite true because these things, uh, the type resolution and inlining don't happen at the same time. Uh, but the uh, Kotlin language actually has a uh, keyword that you can apply to a generic parameter called reified. And this does actually do the thing that you want. This will take the implementation and copy it into the call site, but it will ensure that the, the generic information that's available uh, is able to be used. And so if we have a list of uh, integers and floats, we perform this copying into the call site. Um, here I'm actually showing the bytecode, but what you can see is that we're actually doing uh, an instance of check against integer, which is, which is the correct thing, the thing that we want. Yes? Does a re yes, a reified generic has to be on the inline function because it's still subject to the JVM and erasure uh, in the class file and at runtime. So this is an entirely compile time optimization and uh, because of that it has to, has to be done on an inline function. Uh, you could also do, another place where this comes in uh, handy is you can actually call like t.class inside one of these functions if you wanted to do reflection on the generic type. Uh, okay, so earlier I, I showed this um, kind of trivial class written in Kotlin. Uh, not very useful as a user class because it's 
I can only really represent me. Uh, so the constructor on a class, the, the so-called primary constructor, we can actually define sort of in line with the class definition. Uh, but even this is sort of redundant, right? We're declaring the constructor, we're declaring the property, and then we're initializing the property to the constructor. It'd be nice if we could collapse that into one thing. Well, we actually can do that by moving the val or var declaration into the constructor. And so this is telling the compiler to just do the obvious thing, which is have a constructor argument, have a property, and initialize it to the one of the same name. Uh, and we actually don't need the curly braces now that there's nothing in the body. But it turns out that this class isn't quite useful yet. Uh, if we start using it, trying to create me again, uh, we're going to have the same problem that we would have in Java if we did this. We don't have a custom two string. We don't have an equals or hash code. So this would this object can only be used really by identity, and, and we can certainly read the name out, but we can't compare it to other users. Uh, now we could write equals hash code and two string ourselves, just like we would in Java. It would take a little bit less code, thankfully. Uh, but because this is such a common pattern, creating these um, classes that just represent data that we need to compare by equality, that we may need to print out, that we want to use as keys in a map, all the things that we normally do with these um, dumb value classes, there's a keyword that allows us to prefix the class definition to get all of those things for free. So just by prefixing it with data, we're going to get equals hash code and two string. Uh, and there's actually some other helper methods that are generated for us, uh, the ability to um, kind of take an instance and only change certain properties of it and make a new copy. So if this had you know, first name, last name, address, phone number, email, whatever, uh, and I wanted to get a new instance that only changed my email, I could use the cop this generated synthetic copy function um, and Kotlin actually has named arguments, so I could say, you know, jake.copy email equals whatever I wanted. I would get a totally new instance. Everything I don't change is copied over. Uh, and then, yeah, we get two string, and the two string works as we expect. Okay, uh, going to a little more complex example. Um, here I have a, a class taking in a some sort of database, and I'm kind of creating a prepared statement and then have a method that binds to it. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of a problem with this in that uh, this prepared statement that I'm creating is done whenever I construct the class. So say this is like an injected class. W whenever I'm asking for it to be injected, the initializer of this class has to go call out to the database and create a prepared, prepared statement synchronously when all I want to do is inject the instance instead of maybe deferring that until I actually want to um, call this delete method. Uh, Colin has a, um, a language construct called delegates. And what delegates allow you to do is take the functionality of a property and sort of wrap it in some other class that, has, uh, that can like mix in behavior. And so one of the most useful built-in ones is called lazy. And I'm basically taking this property and I'm wrapping it in a, a lazy wrapper that will only do the work inside this lambda the first time that it's called. And then every time after that, it will just reuse the cached version. And so in my kind of hypothetical uh, problem here where I'm doing work too early in this class's um, life cycle, I can defer that just by wrapping it in this, this lazy block. Uh, and so this will be like synchronized, so it will only happen once, and it'll ensure that um, you know it's doing the correct thing. And you can actually control that behavior if you want different behavior with related to synchronization. Uh, but the key thing here is that we're uh, we're delegating the implementation of this property to another class that adds behavior, and that class is this lazy class. Uh, so behind the scenes, there's a getter and setter to this property, and that delegates to you know some class that implements this. Um, lazy initialization from a lambda. And there's a bunch of these that are actually built into the standard library. Very uh, common idioms that you would uh, create around properties or fields in Java are now built into the standard library and become these nice one-liners. So maybe you want to observe every time a field is changed and do some side effects, like logging. Uh, well, there's an observable delegate which allows you to wrap a property and uh, 
in one that has a lambda that's invoked whenever it's changed. You get the old value and the new value. There's one uh, which is interesting, which al allows you to declare a property as being non-null, but it also allows you to defer initialization. So maybe you don't have a value that you want to initialize a property to, but you know that it will very soon be initialized. You know, maybe in a different lifecycle method or a start method, and you know some kind of uh, managed lifecycle. Well, you don't want to, every time you reference that property, you don't want to null check it because you know that every time you reference it is after this lifecycle method. Well, you can use a delegate uh, that will actually uh, allow the property to be declared as not having null. And if you try and access it too soon, it'll just explode and throw an exception. But otherwise, if you set a value before ever accessing it, um, it'll just handle that transparently. So you'll from the consuming side, you never even really know that it was set to null for a brief period of time. And again, all this is doing is just wrapping kind of the getter and setter call to the, the property here. And what's great is that you can actually build your own. Uh, so for Android, we have ones which uh, can look up, the, look up views from the actual UI. Uh, and it does that lazily so that we're not doing all that work ahead of time. It's just the first time I need to access that view, it's going to go look it up, and then cache it, and return it to me, and also do the appropriate uh, cast to the right type. So it's, real, it's a really simple concept of just kind of wrapping, or, or almost intercepting uh, calls to a property, and then applying, mixing in some other functionality. Uh, built into the language, I'm not really going to go into this. Built into the language is also something, I shouldn't say built into the language. Um, included with the language is something called coroutines, which is a lightweight unit of work. Uh, this is one of the examples they show where they're just starting 100,000 coroutines that print a single period. And if you were to try to do this with something like threads, obviously the JVM would topple over. Uh, but with coroutines, this will work, and it will actually only take a little more than a second. So uh, if that appeals to you, then you can kind of go look it up. It deserves its own whole talk. OK, but that, um, those are the topics of the language that I'm going to cover. And now I'd like to, to take that and interpret it in the world of Gradle back in those three um, different, um, those three different kind of user uh, views of what you might be doing with Gradle. So we'll start with the app developer, because that one's relatively simple. This is just a person that wants to use Kotlin in building their module. Um, it's really just as simple as applying the, the Kotlin plugin uh, to any module that has Java. And what's nice is that, um, you know, I talked about how the interop story is really strong. You can actually just start taking files and converting them piecemeal. Or I guess not piecemeal, the, the, the module's being converted piecemeal, but each file you know, is being converted uh, one by one. Uh, and what's interesting is that the code in, f uh, what are my names here? The c my code in uh, fizz can reference things in buzz, but also the code in buzz can reference things back in fizz. They can both talk to each other. Uh, and it's sort of interesting how that actually works in practice. So we have all our Java code in the module. We have our Kotlin code in the module. And the Kotlin compiler is going to run first. Both source types are fed into the Kotlin compiler. And the compiler is going to parse them both but it's only going to compile the Kotlin code. And that Kotlin code turns into a class file, which is what the dotted lines are. And then that's handed to the Java compiler as if it were just a library. It's just class files coming in on the class path. It doesn't know anything about where they come from. And then it sees the Java source file coming in uh, and compiles that into you know, the class files for the Java code. And so when you then take those two class file outputs and combine them, you get the combined output from both the Java and Kotlin files. And uh, you can see now why this allows you to reference in both ways, because any Kotlin code referencing Java will compile because the Kotlin compiler is parsing both source formats. And the Java code referencing Kotlin will work because from the Java compiler side, it's just like a library that you're calling. It's just class files that you're referencing. And then uh, Kotlin has a standard library, which is just tons of kind of helpers. Uh, and th those that's added to the class path of both the Kotlin compiler and the Java compiler. And then it just shows up as a transitive dependency of your module. Uh, and what's great about this is if, if, you're, an, if you're a developer in uh, an organization uh, and potentially with tons of modules, if you're using Kotlin, 
nobody else really has to know or care because the output of this project is just class files and transitive dependencies. There's no like leaked implementation details about the language in use because of that strong interop story. The downstream consumers view will just pull in class files and pull in transitive dependencies and be able to use it like it was any other library. So this can be done in isolation in certain modules. It doesn't have to you know, immediately become a thing that spreads everywhere. Um, there's also a plugin for Android if you're doing Android projects. And the Kotlin language is interesting because they're also targeting compilation to JavaScript and to native code, uh, which I don't have any time to really talk about at all here. Uh, and there's a whole set of different plugins which allow you to actually share Kotlin code between those platforms and then compile them to each respective one. Um, so this will be interesting in about a year or so when it's a lot more fleshed out. Okay, let's move on to the person authoring build scripts. Um, so Groovy is uh, Groovy's a nut. <laughs> um, even in this very simple build script file, which is really easy to read, there's a whole ton of things going on behind the scenes that we don't really know about um, that really actively harm our ability to write this code. Um, so even just in a simple plugin apply block, uh, this is actually a method that's being called but it's being called with two, uh, it's being called with a map. Uh, and so if you're doing auto completion, how do you know like what keys are valid and what um, values are valid to go in this map? These properties that we set, um, they're just on the project. They're not really associated to anything. Uh, this comes from the Java plugin convention, um, but these are actually methods, not like variables. So I don't know why we call them with equal signs. And then even our compile dependencies, um, this is also a method, but what's weird is that there is no compile method on the you know, dependency container. This is actually interpreted on the fly to just whatever method you want to call on the left. It then tries to do a lookup and see if there's something called that. So it's basically a map as well. Uh, so there's a lot of like dynamism here that actively harms the uh, ability to do compile time type checking and for the IDE to actually help you out here. Um, just another example, uh, if you try and like write, you know, these are just properties being uh, properties that I'm specifying for my unit tests. If I wanted to just try and write this, apologies for the low res screenshots, um, I get a ton of suggestions. None of them are system property. I could even t start typing system, and it knows nothing about that. Uh, and the problem is actually not the all method here because unit test is typed correctly. It's the test option, it's calling unit tests on test options that loses like the ability to follow the types. So um, before we were writing this in, in Groovy and you know, now the future will be that we write this in Kotlin and it's really similar. Uh, not much has changed, but it's a lot easier to, for the IDE to infer what's going on. Remember how I talked about lambdas being the last argument? Applies a method, lambdas the last argument. Uh, plugin is an actual method now, not just a key in a map. Um, here we actually have fields that are on an object that the IDE can complete. Uh, this one is super special. Uh, it's basically the method is kind of generated on the fly, so it is safe, um, but it's still done uh, kind of dynamically with a little assistance. I'm not going to go into this a whole lot. There's two entire talks about this tomorrow. They're back to back. Uh, so if you're interested in writing build scripts in Kotlin, that's what you should go to. Uh, and then finally, we have the plugin author. Um, don't really have a whole lot to say here other than the fact that Kotlin's a fantastic language and it gives you the terseness of Groovy in writing your plugins with the speed and type safety of Java. Uh, and in theory, though I have not confirmed this, but in theory, all of the benefits that you get from the build script enhancements that were done to Kotlin should be able to be used in plugins as well. Additionally, uh, when you're a plugin, no one cares about your implementation details. They're just pulling you in as classes and trains of dependencies. So you can do whatever you want. Um, and so in theory, all of the sessions tomorrow on the build script stuff uh, will also apply slightly to plugin authors. Okay, um, so Kotlin and Gradle, um, basically doesn't matter where you are in the, the world of Gradle authoring plugins, authoring build scripts, or just using Gradle as your build system uh, and targeting the JVM with whatever you're writing. 
Um, Kotlin is a fantastic language for um, help contributing in all three of these areas. And that's all I got. Thank you, guys.